What's up everybody, James Bichelle here and I'm back at you with another video. A couple months ago I did a video on the top five characters who are better on the show, Game of Thrones, compared to their book counterparts. Well today I'll be doing the opposite of that, I'll be doing the top five characters who are worse on the show compared to their book counterparts. And remember this list is subjective, it's just my opinion, you may very well disagree with me, uh, but it's just my opinion. Uh, let me know in the comments if you think I left anyone out or if you have a different take on my list. So that being said, we'll start with number five, the Sand Snakes. <clears throat> now you might be asking yourself, only number five for the Sand Snakes? For me, it's quite simple. Yes, their portrayal was quite horrendous. We got their dumb introduction speech where Obara ends up throwing a spear through the captain's head. We had Obara constantly making that one dumb face she always makes. And we had Tyene playing coy with Braun, and then of course the infamous bad pussy line. And we had Nymeria not really doing anything at all. The reason why they're number five is because, in my opinion, they really haven't had, um, as of yet in the books, made a huge impact. Uh, if you go back, they really only appear in one chapter in the first five books. And that's in a uh, area Hota chapter where they come one by one and talk to Duran about the situation involving their father Oberyn and his death. And what Duran is going to do about it. Of course, Duran ends up having them imprisoned, and that's about their arc up to this point. Now, of course, in the next couple of books, their role will expand as Obara and Balon Swan are looking for Darkstar, and the other Sand Snakes are being sent on various missions. I believe Nim is being sent to King's Landing to take the vacant spot on the Small Council, and Tyene is going to join the clergy. It might be the other way around. Um, but, of course, we have Solera Sand, um, who has played a decent role in Feast, for crows, but she has not been on the show to this point, so I can't, you know, count her as part of this. So obviously, revisionist history, we might look back, and they would be even higher on the list, but as of now, they're number five. Uh, so number four, we will go to Jamie Lannister. Uh, in the first three seasons, I would say the showrunners did a decent job portraying Jamie. Uh, they did an okay job with his redemption arc through season three, where he started from being hated when he pushed Bran out of a window to killing Jory Cassell and maiming Ned in the streets of King Landing, uh, to eventually jumping in the bear pit and at Aaron Hall and saving Brianna Tarth. Uh, however, then season four happened, where they had him return to King's Landing earlier than he did in the books. He witnessed Jamie, uh, Joffrey's death and had the infamous rape scene with Cersei that kind of derailed a lot of his momentum of his redemption arc, uh, you know, by Joffrey's body. And then season five, we had the ridiculousness happen known as Dorne, uh, where they should have done in the first place is have him go to the Riverlands like he does in the books right when he got back from King's Landing in season four. Uh, yes, I believe we're going to get Jamie in the Riverlands in season six, but I feel like a lot of the damage has been done already to his character. Um, I do enjoy Nikolai uh, Costa-Waldo's performance as Jamie. Um, I personally just liked him more in the books because he was snarkier. I, you know, I enjoyed his barbs he had with Brianna Tarth. And how much more of an asshole he was in general. Um, but you knew that underneath, he has a different side to him. Um, you don't really get that aspect in the show, in my opinion. And his, River, his Riverlands arc was great in Feast. It was one of the best parts of that book. And though he is perhaps on that, you know... He's on the path of redemption. We still have that side of him that can threaten an Edmure Tully that he will catapult his baby over Riverrun's walls if he doesn't get the Blackfish to surrender Riverrun. So I've always liked that duality um, of Jamie's character. And hopefully, you know, we get that in Season 6. Um, but it should have happened in Season 4, bottom line. So that's it for Jamie. So moving on to number 3, we have Littlefinger. Good old Littlefinger. I, I, I think the show has done a pretty poor job at properly portraying Littlefinger's character as a whole. Uh, Book Littlefinger is everyone's friend. He is unassuming. He blends in. No one expects him, you know, anything of Book Littlefinger, uh, of doing anything nefarious. Aside, you know, from Varys, of course. But, however, show Littlefinger is a mustache-twirling bad guy, in a sense. Um, and, and the other characters know that. <laughs> um... And that wasn't the case in the books. And the showrunners, I feel like they didn't get that aspect of his character or just wanted to change him on purpose for some reason. Um, I enjoy Aiden Gillen's performance for the most part. However, I don't like the way they have him act, it seems. They want to have him act so overtly as a villain. 
Um, for instance, the scene after the Purple Wedding, when he's with Sansa on the boat traveling to the Vale, they have him act with this obvious and ominous villain voice that just seemed weird to me. Um, and then, you know, there's also the fact that he overtly tells Sansa, you know, him and Elena Tyrell killed Joffrey, essentially. Um, and, and there's the fact that, you know, Show Littlefinger doesn't, wouldn't put himself in some of these situations that would get him killed. Uh, for instance, Liza's death scene, look, Littlefinger had a plan. Look, Littlefinger, excuse me, had a plan. You know, he, he killed Liza and framed Marillion. Book Littlefinger is always thinking ahead. He plans meticulously. Uh, he had this great, you know, he had all these plans for, for the veil and how he would inherit it. Not inherit it, but how he, you know, how he p pinned these people against each other. Uh, these Lords Declaron of the Vale. And, you know, he just wouldn't put himself in a position where the only way he survives is by the whims of a little girl to lie for him. Like Sansa had to do um, after Liza's death. He, he just wouldn't do that. And then, then there's the fact that he let left Sansa Winterfell with the Boltons, and Ramsay in particular, uh, you know, a lunatic. Sansa, who essentially is his ace in the hole, the impetus of his plans, the crux of his plans, and he leaves her to a maniac. Book Littlefinger wouldn't do that. It's that simple. Bottom line, they did not do Littlefinger right, and I, I don't know why. So, number three was Littlefinger. And then now we get to number two, Loras Tyrell. Uh, what can be said about Loras Tyrell? Um, well, how uh, you know? How about they've done a piss poor job with this character? Book Loras was much more of a badass. He slayed two excellent fighters of the Rainbow Guard for not being able to save Renly. He was a respected member of the King's Guard, and he sacrificed his health and body to retake Dragonstone. Uh, Show Loras would much rather just bed Littlefinger's prostitute Olivar and get owned in conversations with Cersei and Jaime, where he ends up looking like a fool essentially. I think they did a huge disservice to the character of Loras, and I'm not even a Tyrell fan at all. I don't even really like the Tyrells at all, but and I can tell you that they did his character wrong. They really wanted to hammer home his sexuality, which isn't as overtly portrayed in the books, and I think it's just disrespectful to the character, because in the show, they don't even portray him as a great fighter, um, where it's said multiple times in the books how great his martial prowess truly is. He's a, one of the best tournament fighters, uh, he's a great, you know, Lancer, and yeah, he was, they did say that in the, in season one, but they really, they didn't really get into the other aspects of his character, you know, and, and I think for some reason on the show, they wanted to portray him in a different light, and I think that's a shame, I think they did a bad job. So now we get to number one, and it should be to no surprise that number one is King Stannis of the House Baratheon. And you guys know me. You should have known who was going to be number one. As a fan of the Manus, I was extremely disappointed and honestly quite angry how his character was portrayed. First off, let's start with the burning of the Florence. That occurred in Season 4, Episode 2, The Purple Wedding Episode. They had Stannis burning four Florence, who are his in-laws, for not tearing down their religious idols of the Seven and not accepting the Lord of Light. That is just ridiculous. I don't even know where they got the idea to do this from. I don't, I don't know what they were reading, because the story I read, Stannis was not very religious at all. In fact, he loathed religion, as he blames the gods for killing his parents right in front of him. He was skeptical almost the entirety of the books book series of whether even R'hllor, the god he's following, was even real, and he had knights who openly followed the Seven and served him, and he was okay with it. So I really hated the fact that they had him burn the Florence for that reason, where in the book... Yes, he burns Alistair Florent, but Alistair Florent betrayed him by having secret conversations with Tywin, which, you know, entailed selling Shireen to the Lannisters essentially as a hostage to end Stannis' rebellion. So that was just ludicrous that this, what happened on the show. I, I don't understand where they got that from, why they did that. It just showed to me that they really wanted to portray Stannis as a villain. So then we get to the March on Winterfell. <laughs> We have the greatest military mind in Westeros, the man who defended Storm's End from the might of the Reach for over a year, surviving on dogs, cats, and shoe leather, and the man who smashed the notorious Iron Fleet led by Victorian Greyjoy, have his force decimated by Ramsay Bolton and his 20 good men, who was able to sneak into Stannis' camp and wipe out half of his camp and his supplies and munitions. It's just crazy talk. And then we have this man, this great military leader, 
attempt a YOLO attack on Winterfell with no siege weapons and no mounted horse. I'm sorry, Stannis is a determined individual, but very intelligent when it comes to matters of warfare. He even talks about in the book his plans of attack, which involves cutting down the forest to make siege weapons, not go to Winterfell with 40 dudes on foot and try to take Winterfell in that matter. It just confounds me that the showrunners would do this to Stannis. I mean, they straight up bent him over and gave him the proverbial shaft. Then we get to the burning of Shireen. And I am of the camp that believes that it is possible that Stannis does actually burn Shireen. I know that some people believe that Mel will burn Shireen in the books after she believes Stannis is dead and will attempt to revive him by sacrificing Shireen. And, and in the process, that will be the catalyst that brings Jon Snow back. And I believe that could be the case. However, I think it's possible that Stannis does burn Shireen. It, you know, it's what D&D said in the middle, you know, in the inside the HBO studio or inside the HBO episode after the show. They said, you know, George told him this was going to happen. Now, if George specifically said Stannis was going to burn Shireen, well then, yeah, then it's going to happen. Maybe they misinterpreted it. Maybe he just said Shireen burns and they fabricated the reason why, which is very much possible. But if Stannis does burn Shireen in the books, the stakes will be much higher. Like, much higher. He wouldn't burn Shireen in the books just to change the weather like he did in the show. Perhaps he does win the Battle of Ice, let's say, and he's at Winterfell when the others come and they're surrounded. And that's the kind of situation that he burns Shireen in. Uh, then I think it's possible. Because we have to remember this is the man who told Justin Massey to fight on for Shireen if he happens to die. He just wouldn't sacrifice his only heir for some mundane reason like weather. Um, and then there's also, you know, the fact that also in the Inside the uh, uh, HBO episode where D&D uh, &D talked about how it was Stannis' ambition for the Iron Throne was the reason why he burned Shireen. Which, Stannis isn't ambitious for the Iron Throne. What he's ambitious for is to save the world because he wants to get out of his brother's shadow. He has this complex where he's disrespected. And I believe where his ambition lies is to save the world, so he can be the savior of the world and get the respect that he believes he deserves. So I think they're mistaking that for his ambition for the Iron Throne, which he said many times that he doesn't want the Iron Throne, it's his by right. He's a, he's a lawful man, and he believes that the Iron Throne is his by law. Uh, so there you go, Stannis number one, no shocker there. Uh, yeah, so there you go guys, uh, that's my list. Let me know what you think. Remember, this was just my list, subjective. Uh, let me know if yours was any different. That being said, if you like this video, hit that like button, share on social media, and subscribe if you want to see more content. See you guys next time.